أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين رحمة الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحدد الأولى أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق والنور أرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المذلومين أما بعد قال الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويقول الذين كفروا لست مرسلا قل كفى بالله شهيدا بيني وبينكم ومن عنده علم الكتاب صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد Respected elders, brothers, and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would like to first and foremost begin my lecture tonight by sending my condolences on behalf of all the Shia out there to our beloved 12th Imam, Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, Ajadullahu ta'ala faraja. For tonight marks a very grievous occasion in the Islamic calendar, and that is none other than the wounding of our beloved first Imam, Amir al Mu'mineen. Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he is struck in his salat. And therefore we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this night and the coming nights that we approach the death of Amir al-Mu'mineen to bid us only a fraction of the grievances that Imam al-Zaman ajrallahu ta'ala faraja suffers in these nights. Over the last few nights I've had the privilege of discussing uh, very crucial information with regards to how Muslims act and behave today in correlation to the events that have transpired throughout Islamic history. And I urge anybody that has missed the last few nights to go back on the YouTube channel or even on the Facebook Live uh, channel to go back and look at the last two nights lecture because there is pivotal information there. Um, I even went 10 minutes over by mistake last night, and I apologize to Sheikh Bahar Najat for doing that, uh, simply because of the density of the lectures. Tonight, we're going to continue, and we are going to start the topic off with a hadith from the Holy Prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, where he says, Ana madinatul ilm wa aliyun babuha, that he says, I, and the city of knowledge, and Ali are the gates. This hadith can be found in both major schools in Islam, of Shia and Sunni. And it is a interesting topic to talk about 1400 years later. For those that may have heard it during the time of the Prophet did not have the privilege that we have today to go back and realize that the only way we can truly grasp the essence and ethos of Islam is through the understanding of the Holy Prophet through the lens of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi as-salatu When it came to the time of the Holy Prophet, first and foremost, we need to understand that the Prophet is perhaps the least recognized figure today when it comes to Islam. When it comes to the Quran's description, the Prophet is actually mentioned a few times, maybe about four times in the Quran. And when it comes to other Prophets, the Quran mentions, <clears throat> the most uh, predominantly mentioned Prophet in the Quran is Prophet Musa salam, followed by Prophet Isa. Um, and therefore you find that the description of the Prophet today has been lost in time. Today, you'll find all kinds of movies being met and being created, all kinds of different interpretations of the Holy Prophet of Islam. And some things that are quite baffling, um, things that shouldn't be said. And when a true believer hears these kind of comments being made about our Prophet, it can't, you can't help but get agitated and think, where on earth are they getting this from? Uh, so yesterday we discussed that the Muslims had undergone several dark ages 
after the prophet's demise. And that was because simply certain arrogant people thought that they knew better than divine prescription from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every time the Muslims tried to come up with a new system to make things better, it actually got worse. Things got more chaotic, more blood was shed, more misunderstandings happened. Um, and that resulted to people just turning back to what they could explain and what they could do. And that was not other than just committing um, actions. And, you know, interestingly enough, our fifth Imam, Imam Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salam, he has taught us one thing, that Islam is composed on five foundations. The first one being prayer. The second one being on fasting. The third one being on giving charity, zakat. The fourth one being on hajj. And the fifth one, and he says, and if someone does not have the fifth one, it's as if he has not done the other four. And if you do not possess the fifth one, then you have truly misunderstood Islam as an entirety. He says the wilaya of the imams, the guardianship of the Ahlul Bayt, that when the Prophet stands on the day of Ghadir, and he says, Inni tarikum fikum kitab Allah wa itrati Ahlul Bayt. That he's telling people, oh people, before I die, I am giving you one last divine prescription. I'm telling you to hold on to the book of God and my Ahlul Bayt. For truly, if you say the book of God is perfection sent from the heavens, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would only deem it fair that there should be heavenly beings that would interpret this Quran. As he says so eloquently in Surah Ahzab, verse 33, Indeed, Allah has purified the Ahlul Bayt, the most thorough of purification, and he has removed blemishes from them. And therefore, if we are here today as Muslims to say that this book is from Allah, and Allah would not make an error, and Allah would not make a mistake, likewise, the interpretation of that book and the interpretation of that religion should be in the hands of the infallible and immaculate Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salatu wassalam. Interestingly enough, from a sociological perspective, after the, prophet's, the, after the prophet passes away, we mentioned last night that many people did not want to see the authority of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And we also mentioned that the people that took the place and usurped the place of Imam Ali on a political scale, of course, never in a religious scale because Shia Islam is not political. Many people try and make Shia Islam sound like a political differentiation. Absolutely not. Shia Islam is a spiritual and uh, as uh, is, it, is a spiritual and uh, completely different realm of difference in the sense that the depiction of the prophet and the depiction of de the deity Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely different than any other political factions of Islam that may have come out after the death of the holy prophet of Islam. So what would happen is there were the people that preyed on the fact that many people hated Imam Ali alayhi salam and so what they did after they established the position to say that we are more loved than Ali ibn Abi Talib simply because we never drew a sword in any battle. In fact, many times it was recorded that we ran away from battles in history. Um, because we are more suitable, we are older, because we are more suitable, we don't smile as much as Imam Ali alayhi salam. One profound thing happened that, that would send the head of any Muslim that hears spinning what would happen is that the caliphs that would come after the death of the Holy Prophet would make it mandatory, or would they, in a better word to say, it would be forbidden for anybody to write a hadith that they may have heard from the Holy Prophet of Islam. It became illegal for you to quote the Holy Prophet. This can be seen in a tradition narrated by Aisha bint Abu Bakr, who was the first Khalifa's daughter. She said, after the Prophet's death, there was much sadness. My father approached me and told me to go gather all of the written sayings of the Holy Prophet at the time we had on animal skin and parchments, to go gather all of them and bring them to him. My father then collected over 500 different sayings of the Holy Prophet of Islam. 
he spent the night being undecided of them until he finally made the, the decision to burn all of them overnight. When I asked my father why you did this, he said that I was worried that people will go to the sayings of the Holy Prophet instead of listening to the Quran, which is the word of God. This, this divorce in these two entities that the prophet is worthy to bring such a book like the Quran, yet you deemed him unworthy to have sayings, thinking that the sayings of the Holy Prophet might contradict the word of God, the word of God that was sent to you by the word, by the mouth of the Holy Prophet, you deemed them divorced. And therefore that excuse rendered and showed us the true faith certain people had in the prophet's capacity to be a messenger. You see, brothers and sisters, speaking very, very openly right now, many people try and deem the prophet as simply a mailman that had nothing to do with the ethos and the essence of divinity who just came and gave us this Quran and left the world with no further guidance and it was left in the Muslim's hand to interpret this kind of guidance. As you can see, that did not work out based on the last two nights lectures. It was an utter catastrophe. It is also shameful to say that the Muslims did a good job carrying out Allah's wishes simply because of the amount of quarrel and discourse and murder that happened within the Islamic states that would come after the Prophet's demise. So what we found was that during the time of the caliphs, the first three caliphs to be more specific, the ones that the respected brothers of Ahl Sunnah call the rightly guided caliphs, every saying of the Holy Prophet was wiped out from existence. Why? Because if you have over 500 sayings in a span of 23 years, then you were going to find multiple, multiple ahadith about Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam and the true status of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Suffice is to say that before the Prophet passes away, he looks at Imam Ali alayhi salam and he says, Ya Ali, none have recognized me except you and Allah. O oh, Ali, none have recognized you except I and Allah. O oh, Ali, none have recognized Allah except you and I. Highlighting a very important fact, brothers and sisters, that the Muslims at the time of the Holy Prophet had chosen a very dark path for themselves. And what happens is that when we get a chance to reflect as to what happened, we attain a certain level of certainty in this day and age. We attain a certain level of certainty that may not have been available to the Muslims at the time, simply because of the propaganda at play. For how could you sit there and delete and burn the sayings of the Holy Prophet of Islam that you profess to, that you say in the Adhan, that you say in your prayer, and call yourself a representative of that prophet. And then tell me that I am not allowed to write about that prophet. Now sit there and think about it for a second. We referred to last night that the Muslims would always fall back on actions when things would get messy um, because they couldn't explain anything without the prophet's guidance and without his immaculate Ahlul guidance. The students of Ahlul Bayt could always explain these simple topics, but those were the people that were killed. Those were the people that would be suppressed by the evil regimes. And then you ask yourself, okay, well, how long did it take for the Muslim population at large to finally come up with some sort of Islamic book after the Prophet's death? Was it 10 years after the Holy Prophet that we could come up with some sort of Islamic teaching book? Was it 20? Was it 30? Was it 60? Was it 80? Was it 100? Brothers and sisters, the first Islamic book that came into existence was 150 years after the Holy Prophet's death. Sit down and reflect on that fact. Some Muslims have the audacity to make fun of Christians whom say that the Bible was compiled 120 years after Jesus, after Jesus' first coming. And then I look at Islamic history to see that the authorities, the caliphs, did not let people write anything about the prophet down. For how long? 150 years. Now, the first book that came um, 
was during the time of the fifth slash sixth imam. And this was basically during the um, decline in the Umayyad dynasty. Things were getting worse and worse after the death of the Imam, after the death of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And a man by the name of Malik ibn Anas would go on to compile sayings that he could find. Mind you, those sayings were dormant for 150 years. So he would go uh, and try and codify the Islamic state with a set of jurisprudences and laws. So again, the first Islamic book that was written was again about actions, nothing about spirituality, nothing about um, understanding the essence of Allah and understanding the essence of the Holy Prophet. Again, it goes straight to the facts. And even then, when it goes straight to the actions, um, Malik comes up with a book of fiqh and then, <clears throat> That, so the fact that it took that long indicates that there was a lot of time that was spent in the Muslims without any kind of knowledge. And when I asked the historian, I said, well, what were the Muslims doing for 150 years until we got this book of rules um, based on that person's limited uh, capacity? They would reply by saying, well, the Muslims engaged in a very interesting uh, methodology of understanding the prophet's sayings and that was through verbal tradition. So people were not allowed to write anything down from the prophet, but they were allowed to say something that we call today as hearsay. Now in today's court system, if you go to a judge and say, well, this person said to me, the judge would say, well, where's your evidence? And you, that would be on the plaintiff's responsibility to show some sort of smartphone text message, some sort of written evidence, something that they had signed, a contract that they had signed to show us that that person actually did say such a thing. But apparently when it comes to the time after the prophet's death, the Muslims uh, dismissed it and said, okay, we're gonna go about this whole process as hearsay. And we're gonna say a bunch of stuff about the prophet and you know, attribute certain things to him uh, and go on like that. And the result of this was a, a, a game that children play in kindergarten called the broken telephone. So they would say, I heard from my cousin's neighbor who said that he once saw the prophet do this. Um, and then those, those sayings would be constantly spread across the Muslim lands until over 200 years later, a man by the name of Muhammad al-Bukhari would compile these books and uh, call it Sahih, the authentic traditions of the Holy Prophet and his companions. And that's why you find in books like these, you find absolutely ridiculous things, preposterous things, nonsensical things that only degrade the religion of Islam, that only degrade the uh, prestige of our Holy Prophet of Islam. How many times have you heard a Muslim run around saying that the Prophet was illiterate? How many times have you seen people say the prophet couldn't read or write? And they say, subhanAllah, this is a miracle that the prophet could say something like the Quran and um, he, he could recite something like the Quran and it was straight from the heavens and that he didn't know how to read and write. And I'm so happy that my prophet couldn't read and write. Um, okay, first of all, those things are found in books written about a man from people that never met him and who played broken telephone. Then the second thing that you oftentimes hear is that the prophet became a prophet at the age of 40. In the school of Ahl Bayt, such a thing is nonsense. The prophet was always a prophet. In fact, the hadith for, that was distributed to the, from the imams to us was that the holy prophet of Islam says that I was a prophet during the time that Adam was between water and clay. The third nonsensical thing that you hear about the holy prophet, and by the way, there are many, but I am so limited on time. Uh, is that he married a nine-year-old girl when he was at the age of 50. Absolute rubbish. In fact, some of the prominent scholars of the respected brothers of Ahl Sunnah have come out and said, by the way, please stop saying the prophet married a nine-year-old. Uh, that's not true based on our traditions. These hadith, these reports are absolute nonsense. Please Muslims, please Sunnis, stop saying the prophet married a nine-year-old. You are making us look bad. You are saying bad things. You're, and you are attributing a lie to the prophet of God. Please stop this. And there's a select group of Sunnis that are actually doing this, which finally, I think after 1400 years, it took them long enough to realize that if you're gonna write a book 200 years after the Holy Prophet of Islam, 
passes away, then these kind of things are bound to happen. Uh, prophet was always a prophet. The prophet was literate in the sense, and this is what I mean tonight when the prophet says, Ana Madinatul Ilm wa Aliyun The prophet was, of course, literate, literate because then you find a, an entire series of sermon com, compiled about the sayings and letters of Amir al Mu'minin, Imam Ali alayhi salam. And Nahjul Balagha, uh, translated in the English language, actually means the peak of eloquence. Um, so therefore, Imam Ali alayhi salam was literate, but the teacher of Imam Ali alayhi salam and the place that Imam Ali inherited all his knowledge from, he couldn't read and write. Uh, and I, it, it baffles me to see all these Muslims take pride in this prophet that couldn't read and write. If I take at least 20 minutes with a five-year-old, I could at least get them to start saying a couple of letters. And then you ask me, well, what about the whole concept of the Ummi? Now, brothers and sisters, Um in the Arabic language means mother, but the specific word it actually means, it means source. And therefore, whenever you are born and your mother takes care of you, your mother is your source of love, your mother is your source of nurture, your mother is your source of sustenance when she feeds you. And therefore, the Arabs have deemed the concept of a mother as Um, your source. And whenever we call the prophet Ummi, we are saying that his knowledge did not come from the poets of Arabia, it came directly from the source. However, foolishly enough, Muslims that, you know, Muslims, there are a bunch of people that did not like the religion of Islam that pretended to be Muslim. And this kind of rhetoric trickled down throughout history for us to now sit here and debate it upon. Now, Imam Ali alayhi salam, going back to him, would go on to say the prophet before he died, touched my chest and blew inside me the knowledge that was bestowed upon him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then I would go about inheriting that knowledge. And when it comes to the time of Imam Ali salam, where he's delivering these sermons in his caliphate and throughout the 25 years that he had people that would ask him questions, what you will find is that Imam Ali was, had the most profound Arabic grammar skills that the world has ever seen to this date. One example was in, a, in, a, in one of the sermons of Nahj al that you can easily Google today uh, is that there were Arabs saying the, the lettering in the Arabic language consists of a lot of letters with dots. And then what you would find is that Imam Ali would take that upon a challenge for himself and he would deliver an entire sermon that is grammatically correct without using a letter in the Arabic language that had dots. So it was no ba, ta, noon, etc. And therefore Imam Ali would then highlight the peak of eloquence saying that the Imam of Allah can deliver a lengthy sermon about a very interesting topic such as death and not utilize a letter with in the Arabic language that uses dots. And another time, and you'll find this in Ahjar Balagha again, uh, you'll find that Imam Ali alayhi salam heard, overheard people saying that Alif, you know, basically A in the Arabic language, Alif is also a very uh, recognized letter that is constantly being used in the Arabic language. For example, anytime you want to say Al, you see the Alif in there. So Imam Ali alayhi salam would then go and say a sermon without using the letter alif, the entire sermon. And by the way, we still have those sermons and you can see the Arabic and you can try and scan it with your eyes and try and look for those letters and you won't find it. You're telling me the man that produced the likes of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, came about to the Muslims without the intellect or the capacity to learn how to read and write? And that just highlights one sad reality about the religion of Islam, brothers and sisters that the inheritor of the prophet's knowledge would go lost for many, many, many years. Not only that, these caliphs that would come after the prophet would institute the cursing of Imam Ali alayhi salam for 90 years. There is a time, brothers and sisters, that they used to go on the pulpit of the holy prophet and say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the most beneficent, the most merciful, may Allah curse Ali ibn Abi Talib. To the extent that we have a tradition that stated that one time a sheikh or speaker that they had hired, Muawiyah had hired, forgot to curse Imam Ali alayhi salam in his lecture. And somebody from the audience said, by the way, Shaykhana, you forgot to curse Ali. So he would 
come back and go back onto the pulpit, get himself ready and say, yes, thank you for your eloquent message. Uh, I did forget to do that. May Allah forgive me. May Allah curse Ali ibn Abi Talib. That concludes my sermon. And then he would step off the member. That was the level of hatred that they had for Imam Ali alayhi salam. And that goes back to the propagandas against Imam Ali alayhi salam to solidify illegitimate caliphs. It goes back to the idea that Arabs were extremely tribalistic. Um, and this would continue on to the time of Imam al Hussein when Imam Hussein would go to in front of Yazid's army and he would say, what have I done wrong to you? What is it that you... What, what have I done wrong that you wish to spill my blood? And listen to the response that Yazid's army gives. He says, we, we hate your father. That over 50 years had passed from the time of the death of Imam Ali alayhi salam, and these people still hated Imam Ali enough to do what they did to this son and grandson on the battlefield of Karbala. Take a quick pause there for a moment. Um, the reason why I decided to choose this lecture topic is because I have seen youth become disenchanted by these foolish sayings about the Holy Prophet of Islam. And suffice it to say that the people's responsibility were to, uh, what the people's responsibility was to accept the message of the Holy Prophet, but they missed the most important message of all. Now, the Quran being the word of God is an inanimate object, understand this point. It does not talk to you. You can read it and you can try and derive understandings from it. But the word of God and the depth of the word of God is not something that you should be playing with. The word of God should be explained through the people God has chosen that are infallible, just like the word of God is infallible. Yet I find people like Mu'awiyah coming and trying to interpret this book. I find people Muawiyah are hiring that were exiled by the Holy Prophet during his lifetime coming and making commentary of this book. And therefore, if you're wondering why we went into the dark ages and now we have books of hadith attributed to the Holy Prophet that are nothing but lies and we should not take anything from them, then now you will understand why the world is so iffy about Islam why the world is always hesitant towards Islam, because there are certain things written in books outside of the school of Ahube that depict the prophet as ungodly, that depict the prophet as unholy. In fact, I said in one of my lectures before, if I were to pick up any kind of uh, Sahih book that the books that the brothers of Ahlul Sunnah deem authentic, and I read about that prophet, I'm very sorry, but someone who leads Salat at a local mosque has a higher merit than the person that they've written about and call Muhammad in this book. This prophet in these books is something that someone that you would be ashamed to pray behind. Whether it comes from where he chooses to go to the bathroom and how he treats his woman at home, these kind of sayings were said about the prophet. And my only question is that how long are we going to allow people to lie about our prophet? How much longer are we going to let the world have the false interpretation of our holy prophet? And how much longer are the respected brothers of Ahl Sunnah going to constantly make excuses for caliphs that had no, re no business being part of the religion of Islam? How much longer are they going to make excuses for the chaotic system that they brought about? And how much longer are they going to cover up the devastating mistakes they did upon the prophet's death? Let's take a look and see how much time I have. I have about five minutes left. Before I conclude, and I'm sure Sheikh Bagher Najad is going to go ahead and do the rose for tonight. Normally I would do it, but I am very limited in time. Um, I want to highlight a very beautiful, beautiful hadith that I read. Um, and I believe I read it in Bahar al Anwar. And it was after the time of the Holy Prophet's passing what you found was that a group of Jews came to the land of Medina and they were looking for someone to answer to the prophecies they had about the final prophet of God. As you know, many Jews lived in Medina because in, even in their books, they had known that the final uh, prophet that they were supposed to follow was supposed to come from Medina and Mecca. 
between Medina and Mecca. So many people, many Jews resided in that area looking for that prophet. So a group of the Jews came during the time of Abu Bakr's caliphate. And um, they came and they started asking questions, where is the prophet? And people would go on to inform them, to tell them that the holy prophet of Islam has passed away. And then they said, well, according to our traditions here, that the inheritor, that the successor, the person that the prophet chooses by himself would go about inheriting this knowledge. And therefore, if your prophet has passed and truly he is the prophet of God, he would be able to answer our questions. So then they said, yes, let us take you to the, um, let us take you to Abu Bakr. And he is a successor of the prophet that we know of. And let's see if he can answer your questions. So the Jews go up to Abu Bakr and they say, Abu Bakr, we are told that you are the successor of Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And we are here to ask you questions that only his successor would know the answer of, for surely he would be the inheritor of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So first question, Abu Bakr, what is the lock of the skies? Abu Bakr says, I don't know. Abu Bakr, what is the key that opens the lock? He said, what kind of question is this? They said, Abu Bakr, who came to his people that was neither human nor jinn, but came as a warner? I'm not sure. Abu Bakr, who was it that tumbled and turned in his grave? I'm not sure. I don't, what kind of questions are these? I, I have never heard such questions. Lastly, Abu Bakr, who was it that was born in this world from neither a father nor a mother, but roamed the earth? Abu Bakr looked around. And he saw his friend Omar sitting there. He said, hold on, let me ask Omar. He's very knowledgeable too. We're, after all, we're the companions of the prophet. We know everything. So Omar comes and, you know, obviously Omar doesn't know anything more than Abu Bakr does. Um, and he actually sends them off. Omar gets angry. He sends them off. And Salman al-Farsi, who is one of the elite companions of the Holy Prophet, to the extent that the prophet said, call him Salman al-Muhammadi, for he is from us. Uh, he is standing there. And he is devastated at the state of the Muslim caliphate. And he is devastated that now the reputation of the Holy Prophet has gone down the drain by the illegitimate caliphates that had taken the place of Imam Ali alayhi So he goes up to the Jews and he says, let me take you to the household of the one who knows all the answers, yet they have put him inside a house and arrested him inside his house. So Imam Ali takes the Jews to the household of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. And brothers and sisters, the tragedy that is the story of Imam Ali alayhi salam is more so than what they did to his family and his household. It is that Imam Ali was available and nobody would go to him. That Imam Ali, had they have given him a pen, he would have written the book Nahj al-Balagha himself. But instead they gave him a shovel and told him to go dig in the trenches. And therefore what you find is that Salman will take these Jews to the household of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And when they go to knock, it's not said in the hadith, but part of me thinks when I think of this moment that when the Jews go to knock on the door of Imam Ali alayhi salam, they see a burned door there. So they knock, Imam Ali opens the door. He says, Salman, how can I help you? He says, Imam, these Jews have come from foreign lands looking for answers. They have not received any. Can you please assist us on this matter? Imam Ali says, very well, come in. The Jews come in, Imam Ali sits there in front of them. He says the famous line that Imam Ali has been recognized for. He says what? He says, saluni, ask me. Never in the histories of, uh, history of the Imams will you find another Imam say, saluni qabla an tafqiduni. Oh people, ask me before you lose me, for I know the pathways in heaven better than the pathways that on earth. So the Jews would say, oh Ali, what is the lock of the sky? Imam Ali would reply, ashirku billah, associating partnerships to the divine God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Such an act would set a lock in the sky and the good deeds of the person would never transcend to the heavens. The Jews said, oh Ali, what is the lock that opens it? Imam Ali says, The beautiful line that professes that there is no God but Allah. Such a line is like a key that opens the lock and allows the good deeds of the believer to enter heaven. The Jews look at one another. They say, interesting. 
there's knowledge here. This man is answering us with confidence. Little did the Jews know that the confidence was that of the inheritor of the prophet of Islam's knowledge. So they would go on to ask the next question. Oh, Ali, who came to his people as a warner that was neither jinn nor human? He said the ant in the Quranic story that stood in front of Prophet Suleiman's army where he said, oh, ants, move out of the way before Suleiman's army comes and steps all over us. Such a creature was an animal. It was neither jinn nor human, and he warned his people to watch out. The Jews asked, oh, Ali, who was it that tumbled and turned in his grave? Imam Ali says, Prophet Yunus, where he was in the stomach of a whale, and the whale would go about sailing through the seven seas, this prophet would go ahead and remain in the whale's stomach in a grave and he would tumble and turn as the whale would swim. Final question, O oh, Ali, who was it that was born in this world that was from neither a father nor a mother? Imam Ali pauses. He says, there are many. Would you like to know them? They said, tell us, O oh, Ali. Imam Ali says, the first was Abu al-Bashar, the father of all humans, prophet Adam alayhi salam, was born of neither father nor a mother. The next one is his wife, Hawa. Indeed, she was created from neither a father nor a mother. They said, Ali, tell us more. He said the camel during the time of Prophet Saleh that would come out from the belly of the mountain, that camel was from neither father nor a mother. Oh, Ali, tell us more. Who else was there that was born from neither a father or a mother? Imam Ali says, have you heard of your prophet's staff, Moses? They said, indeed. He said, have you heard when he turned it into a serpent in front of the magicians? They said, indeed. He said, that serpent was from neither a father nor a mother. And then they said, Ali, tell us more. Imam Ali looked at them. He said, have you heard of the story of prophet Ibrahim and his son Ismail? They said, indeed. He said, do you know the story when he went to go and sacrifice his son as a test from God? They said, yes, we do know this. This is in our Jewish traditions as well. Imam Ali says, the lamb or the goat that fell from the heavens before Prophet Ibrahim came to slaughter his son, that ram, that sheep that fell from the heavens was from neither a father nor a mother. Many of the Jews in that circle would go on to accept the religion of Islam. For that man that they stood before was a man of knowledge. It was a man who was the inheritor of the prophet's knowledge. And brothers and sisters, on this night, when we go ahead and go about our amal and ask for forgiveness, make sure you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the haqqa Ali ibn Abi Talib on this night. This night where Imam Ali was the inheritor of the prophet's knowledge, we ask him to bestow upon us more love for Imam Ali, for the love of Ali is a sign of a mu'min. وصلى الله على محمد وعلى اله الطاهرين والحمد لله رب العالمين